Good morning, wherever you are. Welcome to this webinar celebrating the launch of the Mother's Milk tool. I am Honorary Associate Professor Julie Smith from the Australian National University. Together with my colleagues, Roger Matheson and Duan Nguyen from Alive and Thrive Southeast Asia and Naomi Hull from the World Breastfeeding Trends Initiative Australia, we will chair and manage the webinar tonight. We're pleased to be supported by FHI Solutions who've contributed important funding for the development of the Mother's Milk Tool. It's been a delight and a privilege to work with our colleagues at Alive and Thrive who organised this important support for the tool and for the event. Roger will introduce Alive and Thrive in a moment. We're also grateful to our friends at the ANU Gender Institute and several mother support groups and networks, such as the Australian Breastfeeding Association, the Breastfeeding Promotion Network of India, Aragon from the Philippines, and the Indonesian Breastfeeding Mothers Association. Breastfeeding a mother's milk is presently not counted in food systems or the economy, and should be. The mother's milk tool, we hope, will help. As many of us prepare to celebrate Mother's Day, we're looking forward tonight to hearing from an outstanding lineup of speakers on the Mother's Milk tool. We'll introduce our speakers in a moment. Meanwhile, you will find a link to the detailed program and biographies of the speakers in the chat. Please introduce yourself there. We're recording the webinar and it will be on the web page in due course. We're also going to hold a poll later in the webinar where you, our wonderful webinar participants, get to choose the logo for the tool. So stay around for a bit of this excitement as well as some amazing presentations on the tool from around the world. Next slide please, Naomi. Breastfeeding is part of our human cultural heritage but it's been badly disrupted in many countries. This meeting is being hosted on the traditional lands of the Garnawal and Gambri people. The Indigenous women of Australia have been living, working, birthing, breastfeeding and raising children successfully on this country for tens of thousands of years. Their skills and knowledge about safe infant and young child feeding, including breastfeeding and safe complementary feeding, has been key to their health and survival. We have much to learn from Indigenous women and history. Eminent historian Geoffrey Blaney has written about Indigenous Australians that a mother normally fed a child at the breast until the age of three or four. Abandoned breastfeeding at an early age was risky. The alternative to animal's milk was not available. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Breastfeeding curbed the mortality of infants. A prolonged breastfeeding helped to space her births. The traditional emphasis, he said, on breastfeeding was a boon for the Aborigines. I've used the tool to estimate that Indigenous Australian women provided well over 2 million litres of milk and up to perhaps 7 million litres to their babies and children in 1788. However, nowadays our Indigenous Australian children are less likely to be breastfed at every age than non-Indigenous children, including in remote as well as urban locations. Little data has been collected on their breastfeeding practices and minimal resources have been invested in repairing the damage to this important traditional breastfeeding culture. We hope the tool can help make the case for such investment. I would now like us to acknowledge and celebrate the first Australians on whose traditional lands we meet and pay our respects to the elders past, present and emerging. I will now hand over to Roger Matheson from Alive and Thrive. Yeah, thank you, Julie. So welcome everyone to this uh, exciting lounge. Uh, it's an innovation, it's a global new tool called the Mother's Milk Tool. Um, and I am Roger Matheson. I am um, the regional director for Alive and Thrive uh, in Southeast Asia. Uh, and Alive and Thrive is an initiative to save lives, uh, prevent illness and assure healthy growth and development of mothers and children. Uh, I'm also leading FHI Solutions Innovation Incubator. And FHI Solutions is a subsidiary of FHI 360, and it's an international nonprofit supported by three centers of excellence, so Alive and Thrive, uh, but also Intake and Thousand Days. Um, as highlighted during the UN Food Systems Summit and also the related dialogues, 
uh, breastfeeding and mother's milk uh, is presently not counted for in food systems um, or the economy, and it should be. So this new mother's milk tool will help um, and hopefully cha help change that. So I'm very excited to see that so many colleagues and friends, uh, participant, participants are joining from around the world. Um, and at a very relevant time, when many countries are also celebrating Mother's Day. Um, we are looking forward to hearing from, me, from you, and we are very grateful for your support, sharing information about this tool. Um, the tool and the numbers it generates, it helps uh, illuminate or put spotlights on the contributions by mothers uh, to the economy and the society. Um, and this powerful evidence can furthermore inform and trigger change in the enabling environment and supportive policies and practices. So you can start immediately. Um, you can help with the dissemin dissemination and uptake of the tool by joining the conversation online. So you can use the social media kit we have prepared and one of my colleagues are now sharing that in the chat box. Um, please use the hashtag Mother's Milk Tool in all your posts. That's our primary hashtag. Uh, so we are able to track the communication uh, but also take advantage of secondary kind of hashtags such as Mother's Day 2022 to ensure that we have a broader reach. Uh, and on the next slide, you can see the, the hashtag, um, just as a reminder. Uh, and also, please um, use our handles and, and tag us on Alive and Thrive, FHI Solutions, and Anu Pop Health. So thank you, and over to you, Noel Mial. Uh, unless you're already busy tweeting or maybe even on TikTok. Actually, I'll just leave those there for a bit longer in case you need to jot them down. Thank you very much, Julie and Roger. This is a really exciting launch tonight. I'm here on the land of the Turrbal and the Yuggera people in Brisbane, Australia, and I pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. On behalf of the World Breastfeeding Trends Initiative of Australia, I'm excited to be able to support this launch of the Mother's Milk Tool tonight. We're looking forward to seeing how this tool can be used by policymakers to include breast milk in their budgets, balance sheets and estimates. I hope it highlights the cost savings of ensuring that mothers are supported to reach their breastfeeding goals and the global nutrition target of 50% of babies exclusively breastfed to six months by 2025. Tools such as this play an important role in advocacy. This will add to the growing kit of tools that already includes the World Breastfeeding Trends Initiative tool and the World Breastfeeding Costing Initiative. These have already been used successfully for almost two decades now and are building a growing database um, that shows progress or lack thereof in over 100 countries across the globe. For tonight's webinar, um, we really do love to hear who's here with us um, and where you're from. So please use the chat to introduce yourselves. Uh, if you have any questions, they can also be added to the chat uh, and time permitting, we will endeavor to address some of those at the end of the session. Any questions that remain unanswered, we're hoping to put together a frequently asked questions document uh, and we will be able to answer them for you there. We ask that conversation in the chat keeps on track and on topic and that it remains respectful. The chat will be monitored and we reserve the right to remove anyone from the webinar. Please keep your microphone off throughout the webinar to reduce noise and distractions. Uh, and it can also help to leave your video off as well. Um, just helps with bandwidth for everyone that's here. So moving along to our program, we, we have a an awesome program tonight, a lot to get through. We'll do our best to stay on time. We'll be starting off with um, Professor Dame Waring, um, followed by Julie and followed then by Alessandro Alamo. We will hear some user perspectives of the tool and some more speakers towards the end then. Dr. Phil Baker, Ms. Frances Knight, and then we'll be joined by Tuan from Alive and Thrive to do some Q&A and answer those questions that you've popped in the chat for us. We also have a poll at the end. So we hope you can stay through it 
stay with us through to the end. And I'm going to hand over to Julie now. Thanks very much, Julie. Thank you, Naomi. Thank you, Roger. It is my immense pleasure to introduce Professor Dame Marilyn Waring, Professor of Public Policy at Auckland University of Technology from, of course, Auckland, New Zealand, Aotearoa. Marilyn is a New Zealand feminist, former politician, author, academic and activist for female human rights and environmental issues. She's best known for her 1988 book, If Women Counted, and she obtained a Doctor of Philosophy in Political Economy in 1989. Through her research and writing, she's known as the principal founder of the discipline of feminist economics. She's outspokenly criticized the concept of GDP, the economic measure that became a foundation of the United States, the United Nations system of national accounts following World War II. She criticizes a system which counts oil spills and wars as contributors to economic growth, while child rearing and housekeeping are de deemed valueless, valueless. Her work has influenced academics, government accounting in several countries and United Nations policies. In 2020, Marilyn was appointed a Dame Companion of the New Zealand Order of Merit for services to women and to economics. So you can see why I'm so thrilled for Marilyn to be with us. Um, please welcome Marilyn Waring. Over to you, Marilyn. Uh, tēnā koutou katoa. Greetings to you all from Aotearoa, New Zealand. And thank you, Julie, for your invitation to be part of a Live and Thrive launch. Now, for me, a singular characteristic of Julie's work for 20 years has been exploring strategies to change the paradigm, which attributes no value to breastfeeding. And I'm excited to hear from the number of specialists who are going to share with us how the tool will help their work. Julie's work has traversed an extensive range of political questions, and these have been pursued with a rigour energised by a passion for the rights of women and children, but informed by early years working on the inside in the treasuries of both New Zealand and the Australian government, and <clears throat> in ministries of finance, prime minister and cabinet, environment and water, I don't know any other economist with certificates in breastfeeding education. Now, just six days ago, the World Health Organization advised that formula milk companies paying social media platforms and influencers gain direct access to pregnant women and mothers at a vulnerable time in their lives. And throughout the pandemic, this pervasive marketing has been increasing the purchases of breast milk substitutes and dissuading mothers from breastfeeding exclusively. Um, Dr. Francesca Branca at the World Health Organization described the marketing as powerful, insidious and inexcusable. And has been mentioned, the sale of substitutes and the marketing are all seen as good for growth in the economy while the best food on the planet counts for nothing. In 2021, I was invited to become a member of the World Health Organization Council on the Economics of Health for All. And I want to share some parts of our recent paper on valuing health for all and rethinking and building a whole of society approach. So we wrote, if health and well-being are within the reach of every person on this planet and health for all is the goal, then what do societies need in, to value to achieve this? And how do we create metrics to steer and evaluate the reshaping and redirection that the economy must undergo to achieve health for all? We recognize that, quote, no universal metric can encompass all the diverse components of health for all, especially not 
a monolithic monetary measure like GDP. So we must move toward data collection and measurements globally that abandon such indices and alternative metrics, such as the tool that value the health of people and the planet along multiple dimensions through a full spectrum holistic approach is what we need. And these metrics need to include, these frameworks need to include new metrics, not just lactation, but the food growing, the cooking, cleaning, childcare, unpaid household and community activities, including environmental conservation, overwhelmingly performed by women, all of these tasks. And time use data can help reveal a lot about these hidden activities and begin to capture their true value and to support policy making in a number of ways, including in-depth knowledge of what requires additional investment, which is another target, another strategy around this tool. The council didn't waste words. We described, quote, a pathological obsession with gross domestic product, an inappropriate measure of progress that perversely rewards profit generating activities that harm people and destroy ecosystems. So Mother's Milk Tool we launched does value in measure women's productivity. And yes, it is very strange that in the national income accounts of New Zealand, the milk from sheep, goats, cows, and buffaloes is counted, but the best food on the planet for infants, mother's milk, counts for nothing. However, we walk a very fine moral and ethical tightrope in the strategies we use to call for redistribution of a government's financial resources to those who do the most work. When I wrote the first edition of Counting for Nothing, 1987-88, I did argue that we should make monetary estimates of all unpaid productive service and reproductive work, including lactation, and estimates of environmental services in the gross domestic product. I could see that if this happened, that would overwhelm the national accounts framework, and we might have to go back to ground zero. But the Statistical Commission also recognized that and set up satellite accounts for uh, the work mostly women do that lies beyond the production boundary and for the environment. But as I gained some distance from parliamentary office and the GDP paradigm that governs our nation's annual budgets, I recognized I did not want to see the characteristics of our planet and our lives, which are of an inestimable value, included in a national accounting framework, which rewards war, slavery, trafficking in people, drugs, armaments, um, ecological devastation, aimed growth and progress. And I want to mention my World Health Organization colleague, Maxim, who is trying to join us tonight from the Ukraine and who understands the incredible rise in GDP productivity that is occasioned by war. This paradigm is not a path forward. In the first days of the COVID pandemic, it demonstrated that politicians had to call on and make judgments across a wide range of data from many sources. They should not return to GDP. We do not want that business as usual. For example, an environment is best measured by its natural characteristics. 
as we do in health policy with air and water, for example. From Julie's earliest work, the environmental impacts of breastfeeding vis-a-vis -vis milk formula have been a focus. And I understand the planetary health aspect is to be developed as an environmental add-on, the tool. Unpaid work, all of it, including that that's supposed to be collected in subsistence work. There was a change in the rules of the boundary of production in 1993, but that's all that changed, the rules. It was never carried out in practice. And this work is best measured by time use. And a woman's time investment in breastfeeding calculator is also to be added to the tool in the future. Now, most people online understand that the sustainability of the health system depends on women. The gross domestic product paradigm uses unpaid women to cut health, health costs, to achieve a much wider coverage of health care, and to reduce pressure on the health system. There are satellite accounts for unpaid work that use market estimates of time use. As I've made clear, it's not a path I like, but let's make clear they're all grossly understated. Time use data seldom counts simultaneous activities, which is a common and efficient practice of most women. But not counting simultaneous activities, the estimates are much lower because they underestimate productivity. I certainly know women who multitask when breastfeeding. And some of that multitasking actually is another point about the estimates not accounting for worry work. The daily work that can't ever be postponed, the organizing, the logistics, the management, the administration of a household and its members. The estimates usually use proxy wage values that mirror women's pay inequities. And the data obscures really significant fishing, agriculture, horticulture, conservation, crafts, manufacturing, and maintenance were done by women who don't live in cities or easily accessible rural areas, who are seldom counted for all that they do in the census of agriculture or the household labor force survey. And they're not an easy target for under-resourced time use studies. And the market estimates approach has often reduced the complexity of the tasks that women do unpaid to household or care work without understanding the specialist skills that are frequently engaged. And in 2019, writing on the tool for estimating economic losses from low breastfeeding rates, Julie recognized this. Two of her four key messages were that the tool excluded additional unpaid household care, sick children, and that made the tool conservative. And that proper accounting of those costs requires more adequate time use data. Now, I'm trying to differentiate unpaid health care work from this generic term of care work. Because unpaid health care work for those who are fully dependent has particular characteristics, and it's not covered by the everyday routines of cleaning, laundry, cooking, housework. So Duran has noticed that it includes, for example, pre-diagnosis, providing me medicines, monitoring symptoms, checking vital signs, look at sometimes making herbal curative treatments, often transportation, liaison services with any form of health system, um, obtaining medicines, making payments. Full-time unpaid care of dependents 
demands constant availability, constant responsibility, and constant management. It can't be postponed. And the pathetic economic estimates of the market value of doing this work are degrading. The responsibility is immense. Everything that would be done in a care institution for dependents has to be done in the home without economies of scale. The Alive and Thrive initiative will celebrate what women contribute to health for all from pregnancy and birth. It will also assist so many advocates with data they don't have. Congratulations to you all. And I look forward to hearing from so many perspectives about how this change will, what change this will make in the lives of women and children. Thank you, Marilyn. We are so privileged to hear your thoughts on the tool tonight. And I so appreciate your wisdom um, cast on our endeavors and looking forward um, to seeing how these things play out in WHO and of course in the United Nations type forums. It's now time, I think, to move on to my presentation. Um, so we could move seamlessly into that, I believe. Um, Naomi will load the slide. And okay. So next slide, please. As Marilyn has indicated, our global systems for measuring the productive economy reflect misguided and outdated principles about what's important and valuable. I hope from this webinar talk, you'll come to recognize the human and planetary health costs of not breastfeeding, to know that a little bit about the international statistical framework, including GDP and how it treats breastfeeding, learn about the economic value about, of breastfeeding and how it can be measured and calculated and understand the thinking behind the tool. And of course, to see the uses and the importance of this tool for measuring the amount of production and monetary value of breast milk at country, regional and global level. So to introduce me, next slide please. For the past 20 years, I've been doing research on economic aspects of breastfeeding and markets for mother's milk funded by the Australian Research Council. This has included research on time use of new mothers. And as Marilyn mentioned previously in the late 1980s, I was a senior economist in the Australian and New Zealand treasuries, including in the national accounts area. I also have 30 years experience as a breastfeeding counsellor and 20 years as executive member of the board of directors for the Australian Breastfeeding Association. It was during my time in New Zealand treasury that Marilyn Waring's book was launched and inspired me to measure the economic value of breastfeeding and human milk in a national accounting framework that is in GDP. Since 2015, my research has been funded by an ARC Future Fellowship, which has focused on enhancing measurement approaches to emerging markets and trade in mother's milk with the aim to improve methods to measure the economic value of breastfeeding. Through a partnership with Alive and Thrive, this research has underpinned the development of the mother's milk tool. Next slide, please. So I'm going to talk briefly about this international system. I'm going to touch on the policy health economics for mammals, as I call it. Briefly about GDP measures of product economic productivity and value and why we need to include mother's milk in and breastfeeding in economic statistics. I'll talk about the thinking behind the mother's milk tool and how it might help to make the work of breastfeeding visible and valued. And I'll also lay out a broader agenda. Next slide, please. So, as human beings are mammals, and milk helps build up a system of human babies. It's the first inoculation in the entity breeds. And when women and children are not enabled to breastfeed sufficiently, there are profound effects to human health and cognition, as well as food security and Next slide, please. 
The health cost implications of not breastfeeding, what I call cross-species nursing, are large. Many people do not understand that formula milk is cow's milk designed for a calf. The cost of not breastfeeding tool developed by Alive and Thrive, which Marilyn mentioned, makes it easy to see some of the costs for humans when children are not breastfed. Francis Knight will talk about this tool later in the webinar. Nowhere is there a framework or tool that counts the other externalities or costs associated with the use, the production and use of commercial milk formula, such as the cost to the planet or the cost to other non-human animals. Next slide, please. So there are unmeasured costs of not breastfeeding that add to the burden both on the environment and on women. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. 50 years ago, World Bank nutritionist Alan Berg talked on the invisible losses of a national nutrition, a valuable national resource. He talked about the poor countries of the world, but the crisis in infant feeding is a global one and it's ongoing. I'll come back to this later. Next slide, please. I'll just give you a chance to read that slide. Next slide, please. So the system of national accounts was introduced in the 1950s as a standardized way of measuring GDP. It became how economic performance and progress is measured, but it mainly only counts money transactions. Before that, some countries had counted subsistence production and unpaid household production, but these were taken out. This system has shaped social norms and beliefs about what is important. It counts commercial milk formula production, but it doesn't count women's unpaid work, including breastfeeding. Next slide, please. This system depletes women through hiding the unequal sharing of work burdens. Unpaid work measured by time use shows a value that is at least 40 to 50% of the size of GDP when this production is given a monetary value. Most of this work is by women. As Marilyn's mentioned, it has flaws even in the conception of how they measure time use. GDP growth significantly overstates economic performance because the marketization of economic activities, often just replacing what was done previously without payment. And a recent study by the OECD itself shows that GDP has been overstated by nearly two percentage points a year in major countries in recent decades, because non-marketed production of childcare, previously unpaid, has become marketized. And so it now counts as economic growth. Nothing's changed. Reform to this system is underway, but it's long overdue. Next slide, please. So despite the rules being amended in 1993 to allow it to be counted in GDP because it's a commodity, it's within the rules. Human milk production isn't counted in economic measures such as GDP and only one country in the world, Norway, includes human milk in its national balance, food balance sheet. So why do we want to count breastfeeding in food and economic statistics? At the biannual general conference of the National Accountants Association in Korea in 2017, Martin Durand, the OECD's chief statistician asked me, why would you do this? It's about mother's love, not money. And my answer was that this invisibility affects its perceived importance, and so it affects policy priorities and budgets and resourcing of what women do. So highlighting the national economic impact of breastfeeding underlines its importance and the desirability of protecting it, emphasises its extent and its value, and gives women a sense of pride, I should say, too. And from a policymaker viewpoint, a more comprehensive knowledge of the nature and locus of economic activity also contributes to better economic uh, public policy analysis. 
Next slide, please. So if you don't measure it in GDP or in food statistics, then it's assumed it has a zero value in terms of the economic policy making. And this in turn makes that problem that I've mentioned, which is it's hard to make a compelling policy case, a business case for action. Money is the language, unfortunately, of policy makers. What happens instead is that policies and investments by government prioritise protection, promotion and support for other producers. And in fact, many of us in Australia were absolutely dismayed to see over half a million dollars given by the Australian government to marketing commercial milk formula in Asia. Next slide, please. So as I mentioned previously, the United Nations systems uh, guidelines are now that the production of goods such as human milk is counted within GDP, although services such as breastfeeding is not. So this gives us a little bit of wriggle room and we can argue for it to be counted in GDP. And I'm going to talk more now about how we do that. Statistics matter because they're the evidence on which policy is built. Next slide, please. The two influential, um, two very, in fact, very influential Nobel Prize winners in economics um, actually did a review of this, a very influential review uh, in 2009, and concluded that our measurement systems were, dis in fact, distorting our economic priorities. What we measure, they said, affects what we do. And if our measurements are flawed, decisions may be distorted. And that's indeed what has been happening. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. So as a result of feminist advocacy, some changes are now being discussed at these high level forums, including time use accounting. Uh, Marilyn, you may recognise <laughs> Arthur Grimes there from, from Aotearoa, New Zealand. We have one foot in the door for breastfeeding because it's clear that all mother's milk production should be counted in GDP under the existing rules. And if breastfeeding was more visible, greater funding priority might be given to programmes which expand human milk production by increasing breastfeeding, such as implementing the Baby Friendly Hospital Initiative, financing access to peer counsellor or health professional lactation support, introducing paid maternity leave and requiring breastfeeding accommodation in workplaces, as well as regulating the behaviour of the competitors to breastfeeding. Big formula. Next slide, please. At the National Statisticians Conference last year, I estimated quantities and monetary values at key points in the 20th century. I won't go into it here, but you can see there was a huge drop. And at that point, those low points, this reflects the pattern all around the world, but those low points, nearly 70 to 90% of these countries biological capacity was lost each year. And that remains the situation in a country which I'll mention shortly. Next slide, please. So the Stiglitz and Fatusi review, the one by the Nobel Prize winners in economics, concluded the news example of mother's milk is an example of how it provides biased data, biased accounts of the economy. They said there's a serious omission in the valuation of home produced goods and GDP, clearly within the value of breast milk, clearly within the system of national accounts, production boundary with important non-trivial large also has important implications for public policy and child and maternal health. So next slide, please. So if you look at how much milk's been produced over time, it's very revealing, as I mentioned, it's dramatically declined since the 1850s when I first looked at this data, but it's still enough to affect measured GDP growth in some countries. And I'm going to talk about that in a minute. Next slide, please. So the value of breastfeeding is far beyond its monetary aspect. 
but data and knowledge of its economic value can better acknowledge women's unique contribution, inform public policy and emphasize the importance of breastfeeding. So we felt there needed to be a tool. Next slide. We looked at previous studies in this area. There have been three types and we looked at the third of these to develop a tool for calculating the economic value of breastfeeding. This is going to look at both the volume, the quantity and the monetary value of breastfeeding and subsequently the costs of lost mother's milk. Next slide. The key information to be used, you can see here, number of children, breastfeeding practices, daily human milk intake and a price, which I'm going to talk about a little more. Next slide. Breastfeeding rates come from United Nations data or national statistics, and we use we cover zero to 36 months. For many countries, breastfeeding data is poor, and we developed a prediction model using regression analysis. A chart in the tool shows more details on breastfeeding rates that are generated by the predictor. The tool allows individual mothers to calculate how much milk they have produced for their child and its value, depending on how many months the child is breastfed. You can see for, from this, for example, that a mother who breastfeeds to six months and then continues breastfeeding her child to two years will provide around 431 litres for her child over that period. Next slide, please. You can see similar numbers for other periods of of duration of breastfeeding. Next slide, please. National accountants use a variety of pricing methods to calculate the values of non-market production. In calculating GDP, they value production at market prices as reflected in market transactions even if some production is not sold. If a market price isn't available, they'll infer its value by measuring the cost of inputs to its production. And this is also possible, applicable to valuing human milk. You can put a monetary valuation on mother's milk production, although of course, as I said, breastfeeding is far beyond its, its monetary value and it's far beyond just the milk. National statistics agencies already um, put a value on non-marketed production of foods such as eggs or milk or other food produced and consumed at home or in farm households. Next slide, please. So mostly it's not marketed, but economists have used a variety of approaches. The monetary values, next slide, please. For a variety of reasons, we've taken human milk production as being valued at the price for expressed human milk sold by milk banks. And I can talk a little bit more about that if people are interested. So how the, how the tool can help, let me talk about that. Let me see if I can turn off this, Richard. So the tool will help to quantify the volume of breast milk and the value of breastfeeding at national, regional and global levels. Next slide, please. It will help measure progress towards national and global breastfeeding targets and inform updating of national policies, programs and investment plans. It will help ensure greater investments and resources are allocated towards the protection, promotion and support of breastfeeding. And it can also help give mothers confidence and motivation about the value of what she does for her child. And I know as a breastfeeding counsellor, I've said to women, look, just sit and relax, feed your baby. You're doing something immensely valuable just by sitting and feeding and cuddling your baby. You don't have to be doing rushing around doing the housework. Next slide, please. So there's some stunning numbers here, really stunning numbers um, that you can generate from the tool by yourself, print them out, go and visit your local decision maker, policy maker, minister. The sad bit is globally around a third 
of potential production is lost. So potential is defined that 98% of women potentially could breastfeed if they were supported and enabled by the right policies, right programs, adequate resourcing. So you can see that around a third is lost. If you look at the next slide, please, you'll see that this equates to around 21.9 billion litres. 21.9 billion litres of the perfect baby food is not is, is wasted. We're not getting it because governments fail to invest in supporting women to breastfeed. Even at a monetary value, at quite low one of the $100 a litre, which is what we use in the tool, we're losing over $2.2 trillion a year of this uniquely valuable food. I always have to check those numbers because they're such staggeringly large numbers. Next slide, please. Here we have a country, Nepal, where less than 5% potentially of the production is lost. This is an approximation, of course. We don't account for exclusive breastfeeding because the data was too poor for in most countries. But in Nepal, approximately 96% of its biologically feasible levels are still produced. If you compare that with the GDP of Nepal, it's well over half the GDP of Nepal if Nepal had to buy it. So little is lost at present, but what is protecting it? Let's have a look and see what the future might look like. Next slide, please. Ireland. Ireland, 82% of the milk is lost. This is the situation that we experienced in many countries during the 1960s. Ireland is a major producer of milk formula, unfortunately, for the babies of the world. Um, some big numbers there, but they're the wrong direction. Norway, next slide. So Norway is the only country in the world yet that um, provides estimates of mother's milk production for its food statistics. And they've been doing that since the 1990s. Our estimates give slightly higher results than their official estimates, which are published in their reports, because we use higher estimations of yields, and also because the custom in Norway is not to breastfeed very long past 12 months. Um, so the production is lower than in some countries. And finally, my own country, Australia. Let's go to Australia. So in Australia, around two thirds of, its, of the milk's lost. We have a plan in Australia to do something about this, but we're not collecting data on it. Um, and so we don't know where we're really at, but yes, around a two thirds is lost. So what's next? To measure the health and environmental costs of milk formula and depletion of, of these assets in economic statistical system, counting breastfeeding and mother's milk production in national food balance sheets, food statistics and food surveillance systems. These are bold and wide ranging actions that are needed to preserve this crucial global food resource. We need to measure what matters and stop counting milk formula production as valuable while not counting breastfeeding at all. The expansion of formula sales is actually an indicator not of economic progress but of our society's failure to, to provide fair and equal resources for women and children. And the failure to measure the health, development, and environmental costs of not breastfeeding. Next slide. We also need to be creating experimental accounts to value mother's milk in country GDP in the system of national accounts. And we urgently need the system of national accounting time use accounts for infant and young child feeding and care. Children, whether they're breastfed or not, young children are very time intensive and that should be the starting point for any time accounting system. So finally, next slide, lost milk is substantial as we can conclude, but the loss is not measured. The invisibility of this economic loss distorts public policy priorities it also severely undermines the credibility of economic data. 
Next slide, please, Naomi. So I will, I will end there on that thought. A reminder that at present national economic output measures show a decline if more babies are breastfed and a, and a rise if commercial baby foods displace breastfeeding. These are ridiculous results and severely undermine the public credibility of GDP estimates and other economic data. I said that in, 19, in 2006 in the paper and that work at that time already was inspired by our wonderful opening um, speaker tonight, Marilyn Waring. So that's me, and I'm now going to introduce Alex Yellamo to take you through how to use the tool. So Alex is, um, is one of the key developers of the tool and has been working enormously hard on this over the past year or so. Alex is an independent consultant based in the United Kingdom at the moment. Um, he's a maternal infant and young child feeding specialist in development and emergency settings. So you're as likely to find him in Yemen or Ethiopia or Poland, or Bangladesh, the Philippines, all sorts of places that most of us try and get away from. He has extensive expertise in infant and young child feeding policies and practices, particularly in emergencies and on the WHO International Code and other global tools. He's previously worked with UNICEF and WHO in various ways. I'll hand over now to Alex and he can take you through using the tool um, online. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Julie. And I'm really delighted to be here today. I am trying to share my screen and I think I'm getting there. Okay. Uh, Julie and colleagues, uh, before starting, I really would like to acknowledge the team that has been instrumental uh, to date as of last night, literally, in their time zone. Uh, the team composed by René Raya, I hope René is on the call, as well as Roseanne Batugas. They are both in the Philippines and they've done a fantastic job in during the whole development and conceptualization of the tool. And René has really spearheaded and led the development of the prediction model. Now let's go to the tool. It's just a walkthrough. Julie gave some already some insights on how on the assumptions and some of the variables that are uh, that you're going to see um, reflected in the tool. So again, it's just a brief um, walkthrough and I hope this will be sufficient to trigger your interest and excitement to go and download the tool, start using it and then reach out for questions and clarification and again, dissemination. So this is the landing page of the tool. Uh, just a very brief, uh, just to scroll down, you will see some of the key messages that were highlighted by Julie and some of the other presenters. You have a very simple set of instructions. The, one of the main goals um, of the development, during the development has really been to develop a very user-friendly intuitive uh, tool. And the second has been to develop the tool on a very common or let's say generally quite popular platform like Excel. So you have the basic instructions and then you have some of the key uh, materials that can be uh, reviewed online as well as printed and saved in, uh, in PDF format like uh, the advocacy piece the variables, the definition of all the variables used, the, the sources of data, and some of the explanation on how some of the data are calculated, some of the key references, and as well as the acknowledgements. Uh, from the landing page, you can then go to your main menu, and the tool is basically structure, is basically, sorry, providing two major options. The possibility to calculate or to estimate, as Julie mentioned earlier, uh, the volume and value of breast milk at the country level, as I said, as well as the option, even a very exciting option for individual moms and group of moms to estimate their own uh, volume and their own, um, and the value of what they've been producing. So I will just walk you through on both of these uh, options. Let's start from the country calculator. So you have the possibility to select the country of interest, most likely your country or other countries that you may be interested. 
and you can let's say in the in the name of my colleagues that have joined the team let's look at the philippines when you select the philippines you will enter in uh, in a simple uh, a country profile page that will basically give you the very basic information available and preloaded in the tool so um, number of live birds as you can see uh, the source of information in this case mix uh, the data of the source of information 2017 and uh, in currency exchange vis-a-vis -vis the dollar um, the most recent currency exchange that we were able to preload and on the right side you have all the uh, breastfeeding data and this is any breastfeeding it's not exclusive it's uh, basically any breastfeeding at a certain month and as Julie explained, we are looking at three years of age, so at 36 months. So assuming you are in this page, you have several options. The easiest of the options is that you trust or you uh, want to use the information already preloaded and available. And if you do so, meaning without changing or without wanting to change any of this information you just have to go to the production and value page that will automatically uh, bring you to the calculations oh, no. to the calculations no. um, that julie already presented for some of the countries so in these calculations you have the volume the value and the value in the local currency of breast milk produced the same uh, will be available, sorry, okay, the same is available for the total period of three years or is break, broken down by age groups under six months, six, 24 months, and so on. So this is, let's, uh, let's call it the easier route. Uh, and again, going back to the main page, the profile of the country is the easier route, mostly when, as you can see, you have basically all the basic information. The full data set is available for breastfeeding, as well as the live births and the exchange rate. Let's, let's go to uh, the, another uh, scenario. Let's say the Philippines has released uh, another set of data, maybe in 2022, 2023, and you want to update uh, either the breastfeeding rates or you want to update other parameters like live births. So the tool can give you the opportunity to go to the data entry and you can basically customize any of the parameters that you can see in this page. So again, if a new data set is available or you want to use a data set that you feel it's more trustworthy from your end or you have more uh, confidence than what we have been using, then again, you just need to enter the breastfeeding rates if that's the data you want to uh, uh, update uh, as well, or you can change any of these parameters. Uh, as I said, like births, currency exchange. I am not going to do it now just for the interest of time, but again, I would suggest you do uh, try to, to do it. And uh, what is very important, again, just from an instruction point of view, every time you update either the breastfeeding or other basic uh, uh, parameters, just remember to save and then to go back to the uh, your country profile and then to go to your production page. This is more or less the process. Now let's go back again to the main menu and let's let's go to a country that uh, may not have um, uh, all the information and I believe we can go to uh, I guess Australia again just Or sorry, maybe I want to get me, let's get a European country. Maybe I can get Italy, just in the name of my fellows. So um, one of the information that Julia shared uh, is that we have been trying to use all the available national uh, data when these are available. But as you know, for in general, uh, the big challenges has been with high income countries. So in Europe or 
in the US or in, uh, in, in the Pacific or in Australia in particular, New Zealand and so on, Canada. So this, is, this has been one of the biggest challenge. So you may have situations like in, in my country, like in Italy, where we don't have the full set of data. So again, what are the options for the user? Uh, the options remain the same, but there is some um, uh, additional uh, facility. One, you can decide just to estimate the value or volume and value of the produced breast milk by using the, the data points available. So in this case, just the three that you can see here. So I can just go to the production and you will see that the value and volume has been calculated for the three uh, months that are available in the data set. But what Julia has already mentioned to you, we have developed uh, a prediction model using a, a, um, a cubic regression uh, model that has been identified as the best fit for the situation, wherein we are giving you the possibility to, uh, to fill uh, the gaps no? and using this regression model. So basically you can decide to uh, complete the data set using the regression model that is nowhere perfect. And again, I want to I want to emphasize this is not a tool that should be used to compute breastfeeding data. But this this was just let's say um, a fallback position when the uh, as in many uh, in several countries. I want I don't want to say many, but several countries the data may not be available the breastfeeding data. So in this case. The prediction model that has been uh, developed and tested for the past six to eight months actually um, will help you fill those gaps if you want to. And then again, as I said earlier, you can just, once you have um, completed the, you know, when the prediction has been made, you can then, uh, as I've been doing earlier, you can just uh, look at the uh, various, um, uh, of the, oh, sorry, the, the, the calculated uh, values. So you can see that in case, when, when you use the prediction, and I didn't show it earlier because I didn't do it, but or when you enter your own data, the tool will also generate side by side the data calculated using the prediction or your own data on the left. And on the right, we'll keep the data will show you the data calculated using the available information without any changes. I hope I, I'm clear. This will also give you an idea of potential differences. So for example, if I was using my own data for the Philippines, and this will help me compare the volume and values calculated using my own data for the Philippines yeah, and the full data set for, for of the existing data set for the country of interest. So, so these are basically the three uh, options that we have when working with country level information. So just to reiterate, you may use the, the data that are available that are preloaded that you may have that, that will show on your on the on the screen. You may decide to enter your own data just entering in this uh, in this template and uh, customizing it, or in case the data set preloaded is not complete, you may decide to complete it using the prediction model. So these are the three key options that will help you calculate, as we keep saying, both uh, volume and value for a country of interest. Let me go quickly on the, uh, on the menu for individual and this is again um, uh, for moms or group of moms that wants to uh, estimate the, their contribution in terms of how much they are able to produce, the, the, the volume of what they've, they've been doing in terms of breastfeeding, as well as the value, uh, the monetary value in this case for what they've been producing. The selection of the country is mainly related to the currency that we are going to use for the calculation. So I'm very fine to keep El Salvador. So it's a much simpler uh, um, 
uh, module in this case, what the mom has to do is basically to say yes for the months where she has been breastfeeding uh, her child. So if she breastfed her child for, for the full 36 months, she will put uh, yes or why for all the for the period. If she only has done it for a ma ma lower uh, number of months, uh, she basically she just have to say yes to where the uh, when she has been able to breastfeed. And as you can see, automatically she will see on the right the volume in liters as well as the value in dollars of uh, uh, her breastfeeding um, efforts. Right. So. Uh, this can be saved and printed if the mom wants to keep a record of that. And uh, maybe a limitation, this is only for one child at a time. And uh, if you want to enter a new child, just uh, you need to reset and restart. So again, um, this is uh, very simple, uh, but remember you always need to save what you've been doing uh, or at least printing in a PDF and put it on your desktop or wherever you want because if not, once you move to the main menu, the information will be basically deleted. So uh, these are the two major uh, options available from the tool. And again, I hope you will enjoy. And just very briefly, if you allow me, I wanted to open the pages below. Uh, most likely this is something that can be of interest. So you see you have a detailed explanation of the various variables their definition based on, on months of work with Julie, Rene, and uh, Roseanne, and the other member of the team, Roger and Juan. The formula, if ever a formula has been used, a bit more explanation, and also, sorry, the web link for some of these in terms of where they're being resourced. Sorry, it went just uh, click down. Uh, just a second, okay the web link and some notes uh, in case, again, there are additional resources. So I think this is a very important page for those that wants really to go to the, to want to unpack a bit the logic and the assumptions behind the tool. So again, thank you everyone. Thank you, Julie, for, uh, Julie is the, the, the inventor, I would say. Me, Rene, and Roseanne have been just supporting her in translating uh, more than 20 years of advocacy into a practical, hopefully user-friendly and uh, exciting uh, tool. Thank you again. Uh, over to you, Julie. Thank you so much, Alex. And please leave the tool there just for one more minute and show people the little addition of the advocacy page that we have there, because this will allow you to print out a brief an advocacy brief to the minister that you're going to visit. And this has been done by Alex and team in very short time. I can't speak more highly. I mean, the work that the team has done on this has just been fantabulous. And that's not a word. So uh, it's just fantastic. You can print this out very easily. I did it this morning to give to a journalist a very quick kit to explain the data and a, a printout, as you saw from Alex's presentation of the results for your country. So it goes together as a beautiful little package with the print function there all ready to go. So well done, Alex and team. Thank you so much for the work that you've done in this area over the last one to two years almost, and especially the circumstances of uh, the work that you do makes it often very difficult and it's been an immense effort. <laughs> okay, thank you, Alex. And now over to some of the people who have tested Thor. And the first person that we're gonna hear from is Arun Gupta, who in fact was one of the pioneering researchers in this area when in 1993, he published a, an important paper on um, the, value, the economic value of breastfeeding in India. And at that time, he used the value of the price of formula to make that estimate. But the work that he did was hugely important in highlighting that value for India. So we're now going to ask Arun, who's a, formerly a paediatrician and who founded the Breastfeeding Promotion Network of India in 1991. 
he's going to give us some thoughts on the tool um, and also from his expert perspective. His organisation has played a key role in strengthening national policies in India to promote, protect and support breastfeeding. And in that country, they proudly have very little growth in the sales of breast milk substitutes because of the very strong efforts of BPNI and IBFAN to implement the WHO code. Over to you, Arun. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, can you hear me, Julie? We can hear you well. All right. Thank you, uh, you and Alex and Roger and the team which has come to this, uh, launch this tool. I, I share my heartiest congratulations to you people and making uh, over the last three decades, I think the things we are making a little simpler on the economics calculation front. So now I agree with you that 1993, a little story when John Rode, who used to work for UNICEF and now retired and lives in Cape Town, uh, he moved to um, India from uh, Indonesia. And we met and we discussed, you know, how best to uh, move the policy maker. So we, we thought that economics is the language they understand. So that's the reason we did that paper together in 93. And when we uh, did publish it in economics and political weekly, which it probably reaches out to most of the bureaucrats and, and the policy makers, including politicians, you know, a couple of worst comments we did receive that why the hell you're comparing mothers with cows now. So because we use it, <laughs> values of the mother milk uh, to be compared to the what a, what a animal milk, which is rampantly available in India, would cost at that time about 15 rupees per liter is now around 50 rupees per liter. Arun, we are not hearing you properly because you're um, you suddenly covered the microphone. I think. Okay, can you hear me now? I am trying to because we, yes, we can hear you very well. Please continue. All right. So that was the time when uh, we we used some assumptions to calculate it in terms of uh, what percentage of women are exclusively breastfeeding. So we did zero to six months based on the percentage of exclusively breastfed women, and then from six to 12 months based on the uh, breastfeeding data per se, any breastfeeding between six to 12 months, and, and up to 24 months uh, based on an Indian study, how much production is there. So I will not get into the details of that, but we did try in 1998, a detailed paper once again in the National Medical Journal of India uh, with another colleague of mine, almost on a similar approach, but it was more expanded to the benefits and the, the, the things which we don't count actually. And the, the health benefits, the, the loss in terms of diarrhea or pneumonia or other illness the children face and they go to hospitals. So all those costs, we try to you know uh, add on to uh, add the value of the breast milk. Uh, certainly it added value to our advocacy, no doubt about that. And uh, we certainly help the lip service to improve a lot. And slowly, when we started WBTI linked to it, and then we started getting more policy and program inputs. But somehow or the other, it's like after 2005 or six, India has not moved much uh, ahead, except the maternity leave for formal sector women increased from uh, three months to six months. So which does definitely cost, we haven't done the economics later uh, after that, but there are areas like unorganized sector women who do go out to work for economic reasons and the government uh, does pay a pittance to them for, for the compensation. Uh, uh, at the same time, a formal government employee gets six months leave and, and the poor woman gets about 5,000 rupees, which is not even hundred dollars for six months. So th these are the challenges which we are facing, but having this tool, I would uh, like to not uh, take much of your time in terms of so, so many people have to speak. Uh, this tool actually is, 
makes things a little more simpler than what the way we calculated at the time. And uh, you have got the database with you and you also allow the countries to use their data if they want to change. So that probably can be used to revive the advocacy efforts towards funding part, particularly in the national health accounts. We have tried a couple of times uh, last, uh, uh, when we did the 2018 uh, report of WBTI, which was the fifth report. But somehow a very little investment has been made in the area of support as well as promotion, both in the hospitals as well as in the maternity sector. We had a very strong law, which we got in 92 and 2003. We didn't need much money for that, but somehow we are now lacking money to implement the law in that sense. So uh, this tool in general, putting the uh, value of breastfeeding upfront and the policymakers may not be very, uh, they may not be impressed with the just a 14% loss because they have not been valuing um, uh, women's time in any case so far. But I, I, I think by writing a piece in the paper uh, during World Breastfeeding Week or something, I think uh, do, doing a recalculation and putting up a economic sheet again in the, in the country uh, para, with media as well as other policymakers might make sense again to revive this area of using the value of, value of breastfeeding or breast milk uh, in economic terms. Certainly India has a national health account, so we will do uh, more uh, in terms of uh, going beyond the lip service. So thank you once again. This has been uh, a tremendous development in my opinion, and we hope to make use of it. I'll share across other parts of the friends in Ipfan, uh, if people can try, and, and make use of this, that will be so useful. Thank you, Julie, for inviting me. And, and thank, thank you, you all the team. Thank you so much. Arun is another person who's been very important in my progress in this area over the last many years. And together he and Alex developed the, the WBTI costing tool, which we've been using in Australia to put in budget submissions to demand the funding for things. So I'm now going to introduce you to someone from Ireland, Malvina Walsh, um, who describes herself as the advocate for infant and young child feeding protection and support through the Baby Feeding Law Group. And Malvina is going to tell us something about her reaction to the tool and her experience of using it. So over to you, Malvina. Thank you, Julie. Can you hear me okay? We can hear you well. Great, thank you. My name is Malvina Walsh. Um, I'm a mother of three young children and joining you today from Ireland. I'm a member of the steering group of the Baby Feeding Law Group Ireland. We're a member of the IBFAN Network and a sister group of Baby Feeding Law Group UK. We advocate for the strengthening of legislation and policy to protect and support infant and young child feeding, engaging with key influencers and decision makers in this space. For example, healthcare workers, academia and politics to advocate for political intervention and thus systemic change. To do this, words and arguments must be crafted wisely and sensitively to the historic context as well as contemporary perceptions and attitudes to infant and young child feeding, its value and its place in our society. So I came to this movement from my own challenges as a first time mother and from hearing stories of mothers in my community when I was volunteering at my local Quidju breastfeeding support group and as a trainee breastfeeding counsellor there. My professional background is actually in computer science and I worked in the multinational corporate space for many years alongside sales and marketing teams and also to mention that as a young girl I grew up on a dairy farm in rural Ireland. So infant feeding is a highly contentious in Ireland. Attempting to instigate discourse in this area has often been met with reluctance and trepidation. And there's been a high degree of fear that whichever type of feeding is discussed, the other type might be shamed or belittled. So that type of emotional language is limiting and no longer useful. 
So what language is useful? If we are to engage with those who hold the power to actually make changes, then it is useful to have guidance, leadership and tools for changing the conversation to move in a constructive direction. So the mother's milk tool is one such tool that will definitively change the narrative. Here in Ireland, it is also often difficult to make the case for equality in this space with heavy lobbying from the food and farming sectors taking place and often with criticism that to call out damaging corporate practices could potentially damage product sales, international reputation or jobs and so on. So while capitalism offers a certain freedom to choose one's destiny and to pursue prosperity, if it reaches the point where it is damaging what was not broken, then accountability must be called for. So to shift perception, the value proposition of an argument must be, as the business world would call it, disrupted. disruptive. While it is difficult for many to perhaps reconcile that support, protection and promotion of something that seems priceless or even an expression of love, often justification with a business case is part of the process and that is how public expenditure works. So the return on the investment either in the food system or for the efforts in developing policy and legislation must be underpinned by its return. So that's the use of this tool. So when I had the opportunity to use the tool for myself, I personally felt the wow effect and I thought this is disruptive. First impressions matter, particularly when interacting with politicians and the media. So my initial response was very much an emotional one. I was really moved when I saw the numbers. It shifted something in me seeing the value proposition in this format and that it is new. So having been accustomed to seeing a lot of this data for cow's milk, I could feel that this is a paradigm shift not simply an ideological position. This tool is offering a defining moment in the history of women in an economic context to see one of the many hidden contributions of women presented in this way. I was also particularly emotional upon inputting the data to see the value of milk produced by the mothers of Ireland, as well as a great sadness for the milk that was never had and is often grieved for. Particularly, I remembered all those women who wished to breastfeed and for whom it did not happen in the manner they hoped for, or that they learned about what they missed out on in retrospect. And as Julie mentioned, 82% of mother's milk is lost in Ireland based on the rates we do have. I felt a sense of huge value in myself personally uh, and in um, monetary contribution to my family and my children. Um, but I also thought to myself, I want to share this with everyone and it has given me a newfound confidence. I also feel the tool can elevate the advocacy movement by uh, demonstrating value in a tangible and compelling way that can translate to government budgetary activities as well as the personal relatability in financial terms. So when this data is put together with the cost of not breastfeeding tool, a compelling business case can now be made to governments and policymakers for real change and to ensure the continued progress of our species rather than a regression in health and in doing so appropriately recognizing the contribution of women. Gurvmila Mahagwiv, thank you to all involved. Thank you. Thank you, Malvina, and it makes us feel wonderful to hear your response um, from Ireland. So now we'll switch across to the other side of the world to Manisha in Nepal. And Manisha is a nutrition specialist working with FHI 360, um, a public health professional with years, eight years of experience in health and nutrition design, program design, implementation and research. So she's going to give us her reaction to the tool. Over to you, Manisha. Um, am I audible, Julie? Uh, Julie, am I audible? Yes, sorry, yes, we hear you very well. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you to Julie and the entire uh, research team for right, providing this opportunity. 
Uh, good afternoon and good evening uh, for whichever part of the world you are. I'm Manisha Shrestha, and as Julie introduced me, I am a mother and also a nutrition specialist. I'm currently working with FHI 360 for a Suhara program, which is a multi-sector nutrition program uh, funded by the USAID. So talking about the two, you know, I, I kind of personally felt very related to this tool, you know, because being a mother, you know, like in, in developing settings like our breastfeeding is actually uh, considered as a responsibility of a mother. So, you know, um, having to add that economic value to what we have done, I mean, of breastfeeding, I mean, I feel that, you know, whatever we've done to our child through breastfeeding is now actually going to be acknowledged by the government. So talking about this tool, you know, like uh, it's this tool is going to be a, a very nice advocacy tool, uh, especially for the government and the policymakers, because, uh, you know, like uh, nobody has ever thought about, you know, like breastfeeding could actually be converted into, uh, you know, like uh, economic tool or, or I mean, the economic value of the women's care for breastfeeding could actually be calculated. So um, this tool is going to be a very wonderful tool for, for advocacy uh, for the government and the policymakers. You know, like Nepal is, is uh, actually uh, beginning to um, start a human male bank in, the, in, in our country. So I think this tool uh, would be a very nice advocacy tool for establishing a uh, human male bank and also establishing or, or kind of, you know, an, another milk bank in other parts of the cities and countries. You can know, also help in kind of um, uh, extending the, the maternity protection or the maternity leave. We just have a maternity leave for three months in Nepal now. So probably this could this tool would also be very helpful to advocate government government to extend the maternity leave in the country as well, and for other budget allocations related to a breastfeeding. I'm talking about the tool, you know, thanks to Alexandra for walking us through the tool. It's very user friendly, you know, it's very easy. Anybody can use it, you know, I mean, even the mothers or, or anybody can use it. It's very simple, it's very easily created. I mean, it, it's provided very clear instructions and guidelines. So it's not hard to, to kind of, uh, I mean, uh, enter the data and, I mean, I'll populate the data. And, you know, like it kind of uh, populates an infographic, which is also very interesting at the same time. And, and, and anybody can grasp, grasp it very well. And I, I love the, the advocacy um, button that you, that you've added. Initially, it was not there. So, you know, like you can, I mean, enter the data at the same time and also have the advocacy brief at the same time immediately. I think that that's, that's awesome. That's, that's awesome. So, I mean, uh, just a few free, not exactly, I wouldn't say the feedback, but just a few queries that I had uh, regarding the tool is, you know, like uh, when uh, Julie mentioned in her presentation that, you know, the tool is going to be used for children uh, zero to three years of age. Um, as far as I know, you know, like um, uh, for the DHS data, I mean, we calculate for children zero to two years of age. So is there any particular reason as to why children for zero to three is considered? Because like once the child completes two years of age, the breastfeeding rate kind of declines. I think that's true for all other developing countries. So um, I, I, any particular reason as to why children from zero to three is considered? And another is, you know, like uh, once you start complementary feeding, I um, mean, the frequency of breastfeeding kind of declines. So, I mean, the volume and the frequency declines. So, so, so the cost would also kind of alter depending on the volume and the frequency. So has that been taken into consideration while developing the tool? Uh, but since this is just an advocacy tool, I mean, I just wanted to ask if that's taken into consideration while developing this tool. Uh, thank you, Julie. Over to you. Thank you, Manisha. And those questions are important. We use the um, UNICEF data, which actually does provide information for many countries through to three years. And as I mentioned regarding Indigenous breastfeeding historically, um, it's actually not more normal to continue breastfeeding three years and beyond and part of our human evolution. Um, so any further questions? Keep post them in the chat because even if we don't get them to them tonight, we will use them to develop our frequently asked questions. But I'm, I'm now going to invite Anna Bauerig from, from, Bauerig from Norway to come and talk to us. Norway is a very special country because they have been counting mother's milk in their food statistics since the 90s. And Anna um, is going to talk to us about her response to the tool. So over to you, Anna. Good morning and uh, good evening to everyone from uh, Norway. Uh, my name is Anne Berug and I'm working as a nutritionist uh, at the unit on breastfeeding at the Norwegian Institute of Public Health. Thank you for giving us uh, the Mother's Milk tool. We really need such a tool to demonstrate the important contribution of breastfeeding women to health 
climate and food security. As uh, duly mentioned, uh, in Norway, mother's milk production uh, has been included in uh, national food statistics since uh, 1993. The Norwegian uh, Director to Health, in collaboration with the Unit on Breastfeeding, uh, are responsible for the calculations. However, the Mother's Milk tool has shown us that we can make much better use of this data in our public health efforts to create a society that enables women to breastfeed. Many of us are not familiar with using the term productivity when it comes to breastfeeding. But I think that uh, this conception can be very useful for some purposes. As an example, we, there is an ongoing debate about the duration of maternity leave in Norway. And in this debate, we use the data of mother's milk production and the estimates of its economic value to demonstrate that breastfeeding is an important job. And like all other jobs, the production of mother's milk takes time. The working time for breastfeeding women is day and night. So by using uh, the concepts and measurements in the mother's milk tool, it becomes easier to argue for prioritizing sufficient maternity leave and to show that this will benefit the society as a whole. I am not aware of any other jobs that can compete with the multiple functions of breastfeeding. The contribution to better health for women and the child population, less climate footprints, and improvement of food security for the most vulnerable among us. And the mother, Mother's Milk tool can help us in communicating this, so I would encourage all to use it. It is easy and fun. Thank you. Thank you, Anna. As uh, a no point and very clear information on the usefulness of this tool for in Norway. So now we move to the other side of the world again. We go to over to you, Anne. Okay, hello, Julie. Hello, everyone. Hello from the Philippines. My name is Diane Mendoza and I am an Arugaan trained breastfeeding peer counselor representing our mentor, Maria Ines A.V. Fernandez, the co-founder of Arugaan. Arugaan since the 1980s have been supporting mothers in their breastfeeding journey here in the Philippines. And, you know, this is just an awesome opportunity to be able to represent the team from the Philippines. I am here today to... Um, share my experience in using the mother milk tool and right on time because we're actually just a few days before our um, presidential elections <laughs> so having this tool right now is such a big deal especially here in the philippines because i know this would be a great tool that would be help um that would be able to help our um policy makers in the future so <laughs> thank you so much for for the team of dr julie who came up with this tool and everyone who's part of it Thank you so much and for letting me be part of the testing stage. Um, first of all, I'd like to talk about the experience in using the tool. And um, the mother's milk tool is very user-friendly. I mean, taking it from a perspective of a mother, some of us are really scared in using, you know, <laughs> Microsoft Excel. I'm not sure <laughs> well, with other mothers, but, you know, sometimes when we talk about technology, we're like, uh, okay, wait a minute. But then when I opened the tool, the mother's milk tool, it was just designed, it's just so easy to use. And I felt um, so uh, loved in a way <laughs> because the pictures that we saw, you know, having the mothers there, the fathers there, you know, we, we saw the, the worth of, of the family that, that's contributed to the tool, the importance of the family when they portrayed it in the tool. So thank you so much for the team for putting those um, pictures. And also, 
the tool is so important because um, the 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 breast milk is going to be measured not only by um, the country data and the individual data. The, both the government policy making bodies and individual mothers can benefit because they they see the actual value. So if I'm gonna put you know in in my place. Um, Truly, our motherhood can never, can never be me measured by the milk that we produce, right? But seeing the overall economic contribution in actual numbers to the society, to the society it already boosts our morale. And our morale as mothers, you know, the, the, the work that we do and uh, moving forward, we will already think highly of what we're doing for the country, even if we're just at home. <laughs> Right? So I myself have breastfed my daughter for six long years. And when I used the tool, I placed the numbers just for the three years and then I multiplied it by two. <laughs> I almost fell out of my chair because really I was thinking to myself, wow, that was all the work that I did. That was all the contribution that I did. And <laughs> it just really gave me that satisfaction of you know, as a mother, this is the contribution that I did for my country. And um, I know that when the tool is going to be launched publicly as breastfeeding peer counselors, we will let our mothers here in the Philippines use this tool to see the, the, the actual value of the breast milk they produce. And also we will forward and lobby this to 